Uh, today we're going to be covering JavaScript. I'm going to tell you pretty much what it is, an overview of well, most people know what JavaScript is, but uh, I'll give you the official definition just, just for kicks. Uh, there's also an HTML primer because JavaScript and HTML go hand in hand, but I'm going to assume you already know HTML, so I'm just going to give you a little quick refresher about various things. Also, how to include JavaScript in your HTML pages, which allows you to use JavaScript. And uh, next will be how to use JavaScript, you know, what it expects, you know, identifiers versus sentence. Um, then we're going to be going into JavaScript types, so the different types of objects and things. Uh, we're going into variables, how to assign them things, then functions and classes. Then we're going to be going into a library called Prototype very quickly. It's a great library, but the amount of time I have here today, again, I've been very good. And uh, Prototype is about walking. It helps you walk the DOM, which is the document object model. We'll get into that as well. And uh, then we'll be going into Ajax, just a little poke at it. It's pretty much a way of getting you guys to see what's out there. I'll give you links to most of the uh, most of the technologies, and then you guys can take it from there. Uh, then we'll have a conclusion, just a little wrap up, and then I encourage you all to stick around for a Google talk that follows this so immediately after this in the same. <coughs> you might have come here for that, but you get me instead, so uh, you might as well just sit down. Okay, so assumptions about you. I assume that you already know about HTML. Uh, you've seen C, C++, and Java, so you kind of know what I'm talking about. You know what programming is about, you're not completely clueless, so to your credit. Uh, you know what a web browser is, I hope. Age. And you can type. If you can't type, sorry. <laughs> All right, so a quick overview. What is JavaScript? Well, uh, it's complicated, and uh, it's based, it's not really based on Java. Um, most of you know what Java is, as Sun developed it. JavaScript looks like Java, but isn't. It's really a scripting language. And the difference between script and code is script is generally not compiled. Code, you have to compile, and you've got to run it through a parser, and it puts it together, and it into binaries, and then those binaries are run. But script is parsed as is, and as it comes in, that's what it does. That's what it executes. So there's no type checking. There's no sanity checking. And if it runs into a problem, it's going to complain. So there's really no set development cycle, because generally JavaScript projects are pretty small. Some can get pretty big, um, and they do complicated things, but there's really no set development cycle. So the official definition of JavaScript is that it's uh, based on some weird standard nobody cares about anymore, but it's dynamic. What do you mean by dynamic? Well, it's you can write code and evaluate it at runtime. You can write code that writes code. This is a very, very important uh, metaprogramming so topic uh, that gets a little freaky here. here. Anywho, okay, uh, it's weekly type, said, meaning there are no uh, declarations of really this cool. variable is an integer uh, and it can't be yeah. anything else. Or this variable <coughs> is a string and it can't be anything else. You can go back and forth. It's very loosey goosey. Um, it's very uh, it's prototype based. We'll get into that in a bit, uh, and I'll, I'll explain that way down the line. And then uh, it says uh, first class functions, it just means that you can call functions and the like. There's more to it than that, but you get the idea. And uh, keep it going. Again, scripting, it's done at runtime. Uh, JavaScript is not Java, that's a play on GNU, which is GNU is not Unix. Um, anywho, again, compilation versus interpretation. Uh, the execution environment, obvious, it's your web browser. So there's no special operating system it needs to run on. Generally, it runs in the browser. Uh, it's faster to code, mostly because you can type it, don't compile it, and it will run, well, or it might not run, depending on how good you are. And it's mostly portable. There are a few caveats to that. A lot of it has to do with Internet Explorer, but don't get me started. All right, the, uh, oops. the authoring process is uh, you know, pretty loosey-goosey, but this is generally how it works. You come up with what you want to do with the JavaScript. You have some goal in mind. Then you write the code for it, and then you test it repeatedly because odds are it's not going to work the first time. It, JavaScript, for me, has been very, it's difficult because you can't just run the compiler which will check all your mistakes. And so as it runs, there's really no way of deterministically determining when something's going to break. It just, it's as it comes. 
And so once you're done testing it to your satisfaction, you release something, uh, hopefully with a web application. And uh, JavaScript is really a support language. So you've got something on, this, on the back end that runs, and then you've got JavaScript running on the client end to speed things up, to do cool little things like calculate or verify, all that other stuff. OK, quick HTML primer. This will be really quick. Um, HTML com is composed of tags. Those tags are nested, or they have attributes, and they form a structure called the DOM in the web browser. So the document object model is the, the web browser's mental image of the web page in memory. And that's how it's displayed. So if you have, you know, uh, no, this is, it's, it's, it's as a tree, and the root is the document. And you have various tags in them, like the head tag, and the head tag has a title tag, and the title tag has an attribute that is the title of the page, and that's the data. And you have body, they have all the other stuff. So this is a representation, sorry, this is a representation of this. So if you code this in HTML, that's what it looks like in the DOM in the browser. Very important because JavaScript acts upon the DOM in order to do what it does. And we'll get that in a bit. All right, this is how you take JavaScript and put it into HTML. Some of you probably already well know this. Uh, but essentially, everything is in a script tag, which is itself an element of the DOM. It's part of the tree that can modify the tree. Let that sink in for a second. Um, so there are a couple ways of doing this. You can use an external file, which is highly recommended if you want to componentize things, you want to make you know, certain function calls, and you want to generate a library and you want to be able to test them independently of the page, I highly recommend this approach even for little stuff. That way you can reuse it. I'm a big fan of reuse. The other way is uh, just to, um, oh, sorry. There, there's two ways of including another file. If you include it inside the head tag, it will load the JavaScript and then wait until the JavaScript is loaded before proceeding with the load. That's important if you have certain things that require the JavaScript in the page and you don't want to micromanage where you put them. Because if you include it in the body, as it comes into the body, that's when that code will be available to the rest of it. So you, you have to specify in order. Because as I said, it's a script, and it's, compi it's compiled at runtime and executed at runtime. So if it's not there before, it'll complain saying it doesn't know what you want. Question. Um, the other way to do it is to just write JavaScript code in line to the HTML, which is OK for little stuff if you want to you know, compute the sum of something and it's not really important and it takes you five seconds. That's probably the best way of doing little stuff. Uh, there's a special tag called NoScript. And essentially, uh, older browsers will, will throw in the NoScript because uh, if they don't have the, the JavaScript enabled, this is really legacy stuff. Um, and you will see this message if the script is not enabled or if they don't have it. Most people have JavaScript nowadays, so this is kind of going away. Now, by default, browsers will display stuff inside tags they don't recognize, like script. So if your browser doesn't recognize script, it's going to print what's inside the script. And your client, your, your users are going to see your script when it really should be executed. So you uh, encapsulate that with the HTML comment tags really want to be professional, and that way you won't see the code in the tag because it's not supposed to be there on older stuff, on older browsers that don't recognize the script. Anymore. Little legacy information. Okay, uh, semantics. Uh, this is pretty much how JavaScript interprets what you want it to do. <coughs> so when you, uh, I'm going to take a part of script in the next slide, and I'm going to show you how it interacts with HTML, the DOM, and then a little bit more on the semantics. Okay, so everybody says your first cup of Java is one simple hello world example. Kind of different. Um, hello world's a little hacky. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, display this. So we ha open up our HTML just like normal. You know, there should be a doc type on there. I'm sorry for everybody that's an enthusiast of the HTML doc type. I, for brevity, okay? All right, so. Um, you can put anything in there, HTML, as I said, you can shove it into the head, but right now we're skipping, we're just going to put it in line in the body. So you can put all of it there, and then when you get to the JavaScript, you want to do something. So something you want something to be dynamic, you want code to run. 
um, you're going to go ahead and get to the actual script tag. <clears throat> and here's the layout of the script tag. So this is HTML parsing instance. This is a script. You want the language to be JavaScript, just just to be sure, because there are other types of script. There's, you know, uh, I can't think of any offhand, but ASP does some weird stuff. Some of it can be run on the client side. Some of it can be run on the server side. And so, just to be fully sure and compliant, <coughs> specify the language. And then there's a MIME type specifier, and uh, you're going to be telling what's actually in the script. There, you know, you can put an XML. Uh, JavaScript, uh, not really done so much, but you can do it. And uh, we're going to say we're going to put in text and JavaScript, so it's really unstructured. That's going into a little bit more than is needed. <laughs> Anywho, so uh, now I'm going to show you this one first statement. So this whole thing is a statement, and it contains an object, a function call, a string passed to the function call, and the semicolon ends all statements. And JavaScript programs are composed of one or more statements. Sometimes there's a limit on how many statements you can place and where, but... So when that is read, it will execute this, and in line in the page, it will say, browser display this. That will be the text displayed. There won't be a paragraph tag, there won't be any uh, you know, breaking tags, but that's where it's going to appear. All right, so then you close the, the script tag, and then you just continue programming HTML as usual. So you want to put more links, paragraphs in, text, things of that sort. Okay. Next, types. So now you've seen how it reads what you're trying to say. The next thing is typing. So these are the, the very, well, you know, like I said, integers, or you may want a bool or something, or things of that sort. And here's just a quick list, a rundown of what we're going to see. Now, most people don't start off with null and undefined, but I think they're kind of unique in that uh, they're not really types, they're kind of like pseudotypes. So uh, a null value, you probably have all seen null in C, you've uh, probably seen nil in Ruby or something like that. It means nothing. And that, I don't know, it's kind of really self-explanatory. Uh, there's a, it's something of a null class, that's the capital null. Anywho, uh, there's also undefined. So if you create a variable and don't assign anything to it, it's going to be undefined, meaning there's nothing there. You can do that in JavaScript because, as I said, there's no compilation. There's no pre-allocation of variables. As it sees them, it's going to stick stuff in there. And if it hasn't seen them yet, it's going to say, I've never, I haven't seen them yet. Undefined is, I haven't seen them yet. Now, if you assign a variable to null, it's seen it. It says it's null. So you can see if something's been defined yet, or if something has been explicitly set to null, and you can test for the values of that. That's pretty much up to your style. Okay, next. Um, we're getting into particular types. Strings are your friend. Uh, pretty much everything uses a string because you're outputting string data to the web browser. Um, there are two different types. You have object strings and there are constant strings. I'll get into the nuance of that in a second. Uh, then you have numbers, and they have objects, and they have also constant numbers. All right, so a constant string would look like this. You assign some type of variable a string. And it's in the double quotes. Uh, it also accepts single quotes. And you can nest single quotes and double quotes and double quotes and single quotes. But <laughs> pick what, you know? Uh, then you can create a new string object, which is like uh, you know, a C++ or a Java object. And you create the constant string, cram it into the object, and then you can pass the object around, make copies of it, things of that sort. Numbers, same way. You have a constant number. You can assign it to a variable, and it'll be that, it'll be that number. You can override these values at any time, and we'll get into variables in a, in a couple of minutes. OK, uh, what's a number without math to actually you know, play with the number? Um, JavaScript offers a pretty, I wouldn't call it sizable, but it's a decent uh, default math <coughs> library. You can take square roots, um, you can do the power, you can do maximum, minimum, sine, cosine, and uh, the math is a static class. So, uh, well, actually, it's just a, a, an object that's always there that has a whole bunch of functions you can call on numbers. And they return what you expect, generally. Um, there's also not a number, meaning you passed it something that was some string like alpha of something, and it says, I don't know what that is. It's, or you, you divide by zero, and 
That's also awesome. There's no except. Well, there are exceptions. I didn't cover exceptions, but uh, a little later. Um, again, also there's affinity, negative affinity, just in case you need to. Uh, the IEEE floating point format is uh, pretty well known. Um, it's 64 bits, so use your numbers wisely. Um, you might get rounding errors. Don't really use it for critical stuff. Uh, any other pointers? Right. But you know, it's good for, you know, you want to take some time and add it to something. You want to do something short uh, and useful. Uh, strings. Uh, again, there's a large number of operations perform on a string, uh, perform on a string. This is just a small subset of what you can do. But if you name it uh, most C and C++ libraries, it's there. Um, Again, these all do what you think they do. Care at x returns the character at index blank. I forget if it's zero or one based index. I'm pretty sure it's zero. Um, there's also index of. It uh, searches the string for a substring contained in the string and passes you where it starts. Um, slice uh, breaks up the strings into, uh, I think it's arrays. Substrings returns part of a string. I'm just going through them here. Concat builds strings from other strings, and then you get the length of them. Now, match is a fun one. Uh, if you've heard of regular expressions before, uh, they are a certain type of formatting within a string that allows you to look for things like other things. So you can say, look for a number within this string, and when you call match, it will look for something that looks like a number and return where it is, or actually return the string. And that's neat if you, say, want to look at a, num look at a phone number coming in from a form, and you want to parse to see that there are 10 numbers. So you say, look for 10 numbers in a row, and if there aren't 10 numbers in a row, return an errors. So that's what regular expressions does. Again, you could do a whole class in regular expressions, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, uh, arrays, very powerful. Uh, this is how you create lists of things, and most likely than not, the array is probably going to be the, the second most used class after strings. Um, uh, pretty simple. Uh, it looks just like a, a C, C++ uh, vector, uh, except it, it works like the variables. I'll get into that in a bit. And it works just like you would expect. You create a new array. Well, probably should have new there. Sorry about that. Um, and then you assign the different elements you know, in, the, in, the, in the array, different positions, the values. So I've just assigned the first two values, the string first and the string second. And then you can push on the third one, and just like a vector, it'll, the last one will be third. And then you can pop them off. There's a whole bunch of other ones. Again, I'm, I'm not going to list them here. It's just a micro subset. Oh, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, uh, when you uh, assign stuff to an array, it, uh, like variables, it doesn't exist until you push it in. Correct. Like, there's no bounce checking and all that. Yeah, so, well, it's not that it's a big deal that there's no bounds checking because uh, it'll be undefined. And if you look for undefined, you know you've reached the end of the array or a, a spot in the middle that hasn't been allocated yet. So undefined is your friend, even though you'll see so many error messages that just say variable undefined. Like, well, that's not um, But again, um, this, there's help for you yet um, at the end. OK, there's two more types here that I like to, uh, like to throw in. Boolean. Your friend bool is dead, you need boolean. Um, true false values, not really useful in JavaScript, but they're good for things like if statements and while loops. But you really won't use them actually to print out stuff. <clears throat> and uh, finally, there's the object type. Well, what's an object? Functions, arrays, the date class, regular expressions, those are all objects. But wait, I lied. Um, everything is an object. That's the point of object-oriented programming. Uh, so the strings are an object. Your in numbers are an object. Your, you know, I mean, oddly enough, functions are an object. I mean, that, that seems, seems very abstract. Um, literal constants are converted to objects and then are passed in. You know, you, you pass around objects, not the literal constants. Now, this is nice because JavaScript has automatic garbage collection at the end of the page. Uh, some browsers do this differently, it's browser dependent. But for the most part, when the job is done, and the page is unloaded, that's when all the data gets unloaded. So if they're good, sometimes the older ones don't. <laughs> so it makes things different. So garbage collection is a plus. Objects make that easier. And uh, there are different operators. Uh, the operators act on the objects. So it doesn't really make sense to say 
Well, it makes sense to say number plus another number equals something. But it's a little strange to have number plus a string. <laughs> or is, is the number 5 equal to uh, 60 the characters, you know, random characters in the string? And they can be, is the strange part. Because they're all objects, they might have uh, implicit conversions. So maybe if you've got the number 5 in a string with 5 in it, um, it'll convert it to a number first, or try to, and if it can't, it'll convert it to not a number, and then they won't be, you know, they won't be the same. Okay, so the, the double equal sign, you guys are all familiar, so there's two equals. That uh, performs the type conversion implicitly. It will try and get them to be the same if they're not. The triple equal sign, which is uh, down here, I'm in the way, sorry. The triple equal sign will say uh, that Guess it. Try and you know, don't convert the uh, don't convert the types if they're not the same type. So if you're comparing apples to apples, sure that works. But if you're comparing an apple to an orange, and they both happen to have uh, a, you know an instance member called color, and they're the same, the triple equals will catch that, but the double equal will not. So the double equal has no problem converting an apple to an orange to compare two oranges. But the triple equal sign will say, oh, that's an apple, that's an orange. They don't go together. OK, variables and assignments. Variables, again, are declared um, as they come in, so as they are seen. So you declare them with var, the var key. Um, OK, so there's no type, I said before. So if you see a variable, it'll be var and then the variable name, just like you, you've seen in uh, C, C++ and stuff. <clears throat> and uh, scope is a troubling problem, and I'll get to that in a second. OK, so the var keyword, variables, storage, makes sense. So you can take values and information and put them into variables. Um, everything is a pointer. All your objects are pointers. So it uses the standard Java dot syntax. Gosh, it's the C syntax. but Everything's a new, and everything's just considered an object. That helps you out uh, because you don't have to care. And like I said, JavaScript coding is for rapid development. You shouldn't have to care. Uh, it's really not that. Consequently, JavaScript applications tend to run a little bit slower. Um, the main problem here is scoping uh, because you can have variables popping in and out at any given time depending on where you are in the code. And it gets a little hairy. Um, so let's go here. Say we have a variable named x, and we assign it the number 10. <coughs> this variable is at global scope. And assuming that you, you cram this into uh, you know, the script, the HTML, everything below x will see x as having the value of 10. Everything above it will have x having the value of undefined. OK? Now, say you want to call a function. And that function wants to have a variable named x. Well, if you don't declare this x, it will assume you mean the x above. So it's defining, so, so even though x might be undefined above, it'll define it in the function. And when the function returns, it'll go away. But uh, if you don't define it here, it'll assume you mean the global scope. And you'll get weird stuff happening. It just won't look right. And if, it doesn't look, if variables are taking on values that you've never seen before, it's probably a scoping issue. Um, <laughs> Also, classes have uh, this scope, uh, kind of, not really, because classes don't execute code, really. Functions execute code. Classes hold variables, and they have methods that interact with variables. OK, and next we have the parent. So you guys know about um, uh, code that calls code. It's like a function. Right? I forget what that's called right now. But you have nested, nested function calls. So you have R calling R calling R calling R calling R. Recursive is the name of it. Recursive function calls. Um, you get weird stuff happening when you get recursive function calls, but it's not so weird if you keep scope in mind. So say you have a function R that's setting x to 13. Well, it's going to go to where it was called and then try and use the next variable up. So if you have 30 levels of R, all trying to set x to 13, it will go all the way back up to where it sees x defined. And if it doesn't, then it'll stick it in itself. But you want to be sure, and if you want storage allocated at a particular scope, use the bar. Otherwise, you'll get madness. 
you get frustrated and you'll hit your computer. And I don't advocate computer violence and computer on computer violence. Anyway, there's also another type of syntax for setting variables, um, setting values to variables. It's called the object literal syntax. It looks kind of funky and it reminds me of YAML, which is another type. I'm not getting into that. But anyway, you have to keep in mind how JavaScript is storing information. And here's a little peek under the hood. It's called a hash. If anybody's used the C++ map, or the uh, or Java has uh, a hash uh, hash class, essentially you can assign variables string names and then associate them with values in the hash, and that's what they're doing for everything. And so if you have uh, you know you can put hashes and hashes, and those are classes. Those are nested, and that's what you see here in this email which I stole from uh, a previous presenter. Um, so you're saying this variable email has a sub hash, has a hash here, the first entry, the variable name inside email. So email dot message is hot. Email dot details is equal to its own hash. Email dot details dot two is Tommy Trojan. Make sense? Okay. Okay, now so that's variables. Now we're going to actually act on the variables. Let's do something important. This is the, this is the point of this. Here. You know, so far it's just been fluff. Okay, so functions are to do something. And they act on variables, and they act on arguments, and they produce output. Or they produce other variables, which, as I said before, are all objects. Um, yeah. And I'll get to a special function call called eval at the end, which you can't live without, really if you want to do super cool neat stuff that the dark arts advocate. Anywho, um, just like C and C++ functions, mostly. A few little deviations here and there. Uh, functions are great for versatile code because if you have something that you want to use more than once, or you want to specify once and you know test over and over again and use it some other project, uh, that's uh, that you should probably make them a function so that Otherwise, you're going to be copying and pasting, and as Wolchinski says, that's not good. Well, I don't think he said it exactly. Anywho, um, you could also, as I said, build libraries of functions, uh, and you know you, you get a whole bunch of them. Put them in a, as I said, put them in the include file, and then use them in the uh, you know, script source to include them into it. Um, so then you can test them and all that other stuff. Anywho, they're also used for building classes. And it's a weird syntax. I'll get to that when we get to classes. Um, uh, so there's an important caveat with functions. Well, it's not really. If you understand that you have to declare stuff before you use it. As I said, there's no pre-compilation. So if the function isn't defined yet, JavaScript's going to say, I have no idea what you want to do. I haven't seen this function. Even if the function is defined right after what you want to have happen. So you say, use this function, then you declare the function won't happen. So you can't cram all your functions at the end of the file. You've got to put them in the, in the above. above. OK, so as I said before, functions are objects. You can pass them around like objects. You can create new functions. And you can edit them in real time and do all sorts of weird stuff. Um, all right, I'm going to jump right into a function example. And uh, there's a happy little function. You probably have all seen something like this in your previous programming classes. And I'm going to go ahead and break down into the uh, anatomy here. <coughs> All right, so there's a function keyword JavaScript. It says, JavaScript, I'm writing a function. You better listen. <laughs> and you want to name them something. Otherwise, how are you going to refer to them? Uh, I guess you can have unnamed functions. But uh, again, you have to put in a variable. And yeah, most of the time, you're going to name them. They take arguments. Nothing really special. And then you open up the body of the function. You actually write what the function is going to do. But what's missing? It's the return type. Java does not, JavaScript does not have return types. So whatever you return is the type that it's going to be. So you can return multiple types. You can return an integer. You can return a string. It doesn't care. It'll do the conversion for you. Well, unless it's really bad, it doesn't know that. OK. I like to declare all my variables up front, because if you don't, you'll get those weird scoping issues I talked to you about. So that's probably a good thing to do first. Um, you can do it as they come and do it the C++ style, but if you mess up, 
Don't come crying to me. <laughs> okay, um, functions, support, control state. Uh, you can do ifs, whiles, fors, do whiles, uh, for in. You know, so you can actually get it to do something based on the input. Yeah, you know, it's probably important. Um, as I said, lots of, lots of options. So right here, here's what I did. I said, if A is greater than B, we're going to store A into the return value. Otherwise, B is going to get stored into the return value. Now, it's not really stored. It's getting a copy of the pointer, but you don't really care. All right, so as I said before, we can return the value, which is going to be, hmm, I don't know. What, is, what, what type is the return value? Well, the arguments don't tell you anything. They can pass in two strings. It doesn't care. And it'll do the comparison on two strings. Maybe, it, maybe it'll check for them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it'll it'll convert them to. Well, it actually will do a string comparison if they're two strings. Uh, I think the left side gets importance if it's you know one integer, one number, and one string. I think it'll convert it to a number, whichever one's on the left. <clears throat> Don't quote me on that. All right, so that's actually returning a value. This one's returning nothing. It's null. Uh, I don't know. You could do that as you see fit if you need to return nothing. Don't really return undefined. Um, I, I think you can, but um, that, that doesn't really make sense. <laughs> the value you return should definitely be defined as something. So return null, not undefined. Otherwise, I'll look at you funny. Um, all right, then at the end, you close the body tag. And your function is done. It's ready to run. You don't look excited. All right, so how do we use these things? Well, you can uh, just use them as you see them, and it's pretty much just like C and C++. Uh, you can create new variables and pass them in. You can pass in variables as uh, constant literals. Again, they're called convert to objects and all the like. Then you can take the return value, which is a single value. There's no, no piggybacking of more than one value here. And store it into a, another variable, or you can pass it into a, another if statement, pass it into another function, what have you. And then uh, you can also, well, this is another function, so that's an example. Arguments, special, special, special little guys. Most people don't know this about JavaScript, but uh, the arguments are actually a variable argument. Well, it's stored as an array, which means you could specify functions with zero arguments and take in any number of arguments. Yeah, I think I lost you there. Okay, so the objects is just a vector called arguments. Arguments is a vector called arguments. Okay. So if you want to get the first argument off that vector, you call arguments zero. And that's the first one. And you go all the way until it's undefined, or because it's an array, you call length and get how many arguments you have. So it's just like the uh, variable arguments in C and C++. I don't know if Java has an equivalent. Um, so, if no parameters, so if you actually declare a function with parameters, but they don't pass in any parameters, those parameters, those variables, will be considered undefined. So if you have a function that takes in one parameter as, I don't know, let's say, spider, and you know they don't pass in anything, they just call the function and close it, and they say, oh, done. It'll say, spider was not defined. I don't know what to do. <laughs> not really helpful, but now you know what to look for and why. OK, uh, so you can return you can return at any time in a function. Uh, but as I said, uh, you really don't want to return undefined. So you want to return null or, or, or what the value you return. Um, that's pretty cool that you can pass in whatever you want to export whatever you want. Sorry, I'm going too fast here. Slow me down. <coughs> All right, so there's a quick rundown of how to use the arguments variable. Well, you guys already told me how to use it. Again, just you know, grab it out of it, just like a, a vector or an array. All right, now, the almighty powerful function, never forget its name. It is eval. All hail eval. It is the greatest function in the world. Kind of <laughs> sort of it has problems. But um, you will see just how cool it is. Eval takes a string. I guess it could take a number two because there's no typing. So be very careful what you pass into it. Generally, it's a string. Um, and JavaScript will look at what you pass to eval and think of it as code. So you can have code that writes code based on user input. 
And this is done via the magic of eval. So say you have, uh, I don't know, just out of morbid curiosity, you have an array and you don't really care for the syntax of the bracket operator. You could make a string that models the syntax and increment i in the middle and just say uh, my vector bracket and string plus your i plus the string and bracket semicolon and then you could do whatever you want from there. But sometimes that's important for referring to objects in the DOM. We'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so uh, again I'll show you a quick little example. What do you think this does? Does it execute the function? Define it. It defines the function. You just wrote a function. Well, you, well, you didn't. JavaScript wrote it. So don't take credit for what's not yours. <laughs> OK. Next, we move on to classes. After the almighty power of eval is classes. Not really so powerful in JavaScript because most people don't use them out of laziness or whatever. Classes are nice because they help encapsulate data, which is important if you want to do, um, you know, keep your sanity in certain situations. <laughs> Um, uh, you can also lump functions together into classes so that the functions get called on that name. Classes have members, just like C, C++, and Java, so you can cram data into it as much as you want. Um, they, they have constructors. I'll get into that in a second. Um, there are methods and then there are prototypes. Uh, it's kind of a difficult one. I'll get to that in a second, too. But methods and prototypes are linked together. Just keep that in mind. And destructors. Uh, not really. Uh, JavaScript has a automatic garbage collection. Well, a, a, a somewhat automatic garbage collection. And uh, why well, call it destructor if you don't care? So there really aren't any destructors. Just keep that. There's no big. I mean, I'm sure you could call destroy on why. Okay. So um, this, um, classes are objects, just like everything else. There's no hidden magic. There's no secrets. Kind of. Um, they have a special keyword called this. So if uh, you, you well, kind of hard to describe. This just means it's in the class that you're referring to. Getting a this value is kind of strange. I'll get to that when we get to prototypes, uh, prototyping and, and uh, member methods. Uh, don't use var. Uh, you can in the functions. Go ahead in the functions. But it doesn't make sense to declare a variable in a class like this because it's a hash. So you're actually creating a new object and you assign variables you know, whatever variable name you give it, so this dot my variable name, my variable name is the key in the hash and whatever your value is, so etc. So var doesn't make sense in classes. It makes sense in the functions, not the class itself. Um, so you don't have to declare any variables. Uh, they get created as you use them. So that's cool and dangerous in the same stroke. Um, I leave that to you to figure out uh, which. And this is how you call them. So if you've created uh, an instance of my object, so you've called the constructor and you've got a my object, you can call the member variable, you know, you can access it like this. So you can say equals some value or is, you know, is being set to some other value. So you have a variable here equals my object member variable. You know, it all makes sense. <coughs> okay, construction. Very, very strange syntax -y thing they have here. There really is no constructor per se. It's really just a function that creates a new object that comes preloaded with what you want. So it's not, there's no, well, there is a class keyword, but it doesn't do what you think it does. This is how you create classes repeated. Now, you could call this. You could say, new object, I want a donut. Donuts have sprinkles, and I want 35 sprinkles. Donuts have, does my donut have a hole? Yes. Oh, well, maybe I don't have a hole in this donut. It's just a round, cakey thing. That's not a donut. Okay. Does it have filling? Of course it does. It's some kind of chocolatey thingy, maybe some fruit. <laughs> um, but if you call this code, and you call it once, well, how do you make more than one donut? You're going to have to copy this over and over again. What are functions for? So you don't copy code. The old Wachinsky thing. So, um, you create a function that creates objects that come preloaded with whatever. And you can pass in arguments, as again, you can create variable arguments, and you can generate crazy classes based off of the variable argument list and do whatever you please, really. Um, so, you create them, you can create functions to help you out, to help you make more than one donut. As we all know, once you have one, 
really can't stop. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> next, class methods. So this cl class methods act on class hmm. members. So if an object has sprinkles, a class uh, method should operate on the instance variable's member called sprinkles. Okay, so uh, if you have something called, um, if you want to create a function called add sprinkles, you want to you know, put more sprinkles onto the, onto the uh, donut. So you'll have just common syntax like the function calls. You'll pass in a single argument just because you can pass in more if you want. And you want to add to the sprinkles. Now, what's going on here? It's saying add sprinkles. If you called add sprinkles as is, with nothing else. You just say, add sprinkles, 10. It's going to say, well, where are sprinkles? It sounds like a dog name, but it's not. It's going to try and find the global variable named sprinkles, which isn't what you want. Um, so you need to prefix this with the this keyword. Sorry, I didn't do that. I missed that, I guess. You want this dot sprinkles plus equals more sprinkles, please. That, that way it'll assign it to whoever's calling the function. And that's where we get into the member function stuff. Um, this doesn't know that it's associated with a donut class. There's no way of saying, hey function, you're part of the donut class, except if you use the prototypes. And the prototypes is a special hash inside every object. So a donut's an object, and it has a prototype. And the prototype says, these are the functions that I know about. And so when uh, you say donut.prototype.addSprinkles, you're saying this function name points to this function, which points to this function. And if you use the this keyword, the class that's calling the function will be the this keyword. So that's how you access stuff inside a member function. And that's made passable through your prototype, they call it prototypes, it's very confusing, but some other person made the library after it. I'll try and, I'll try and help out there. But essentially, you can create a shared property or a shared method to all the objects. So all donuts will now have a member name, a member, very, a member function named as sprinkles. So before, you had to you know, pass into this, and you know, pass into this. It just cleans up stuff, and cleans up the syntax. So it has inheritance. So if you create a donut, uh, maybe you create a, hmm, name a good one. Maybe like a bear claw. Bear claw from a donut. And uh, so you have, uh, well, there's no real you know, inheritance scheme. You'd say bear claw dot prototypes dot add sprinkles. Now, I don't care if you're a crazy person to add sprinkles to your bear claw like Mike does. <laughs> but you can add sprinkles to your bear claw if you so choose. Um, so why, why are prototypes helpful? Well, they help you do what functions are supposed to do, and that is reduce code, and you know, it's tested. <coughs> if you write it once, it runs everywhere, kind of. Um, there's also a neat little thing called mix-ins, well, where you can take two classes and throw in you know, uh, methods and variable, uh, oh yeah, it's variables, but class members on the fly and create new classes as conglomerates of other classes. As long as you check for undefined, things will usually go your way. Let's see. So, how would you add a two string function to all objects? You want to convert all objects to a string. How could you possibly do that? Well, object dot prototype to s equals whatever function. So you can change every object because all those objects inherit off of that base object, you can add a function to every object. This is really cool if you've got this neat little string function. I don't know, say it, it reads half the string, throws the other half away, does some magic and gives you a, a cookie or something. <laughs> I don't know. So you could take that one method, install it into the string, and now you can call it just as if it was part of the string library. So maybe length isn't enough for you. Maybe you want length squared, you're greedy or something. So you say, New function, length squoop, and then, uh, and then you'd, you'd, you'd write it out, and then you'd say string dot prototype dot uh, length squoop equals length squoop. That's a bad example, but you know. Again, let's go back here. The names don't have to match, 
So you can alias functions with this. You could say um, more sprinkles equals add sprinkles, and it will refer to, you know, if you say donut dot more sprinkles, it will use add sprinkles. Try not to do that because if you're if somebody's coming after you, you want them to you know have a head of hair when they leave. It just makes things easier. Although, you know, aim them similarly if you have to change the name a bit. Okay, now we get to prototype. And this is a headache because it's different from object.prototype. Prototype is a library that I have fallen in love with, and you will too. Time for Valentine's Day. Um, anywho, it's a library. And it lets you walk the DOM, make AJAX requests. It's just easy. You could do it the hard way if you really wish, but not in time for Valentine's Day. <laughs> All right, so um, finally, events. What are events? You got to think. Well, the event can be something the browser does, which is like something like finish <coughs> loading, or it can be something the user does, which is falling asleep on the keyboard and hitting the Z key a thousand times, <laughs> or it can be something the JavaScript code does. It's usually one of those three. If I can think of another one, I'll yell it out, but generally that pretty much covers it. Okay, so the library, um, it's available, public, free, GNU, whatever license, I don't really know the license, but it's there for you and you can use it for projects and it's nice and cozy and happy. What does it do? Uh, easy AJAX stuff. So instead of creating the HTML, XML request yourself and sending it off and waiting for it to come back and handling errors and all that other stuff, it gives you a nice clean syntax for doing all that. And uh, it's available on the web. I don't know if I have an example here, but I'll show that in a bit. Um, it also lets you do DOM walking. Now, JavaScript, and I'll get to DOM walking in a second, gives you this option, gives you a way of doing this, but it's really ugly, at least in my opinion. Um, it also gives you iterators, uh, lets you do things like um, for each element in some array, do something. Or <coughs> grab, uh, grab all the elements in the array that are greater than six, or, or something like that. The syntax is just beautiful. I won't get into that. But Go to the website if you really like, <coughs> and that's the container function. Okay, the DOM. It's this magical, magical thing that all browsers know about but won't tell. Mm -hmm. um, it's called the document object model, or document object model, you guys. Um, and it's represented as a tree. <coughs> and by that, most things, almost everything, has a parent node, except probably the document. <laughs> so the root of it has no parent node. I don't know what you get with that. You would really try. Um, but usually the top of the tree is document. That is the penultimate place where everything goes under. And everything else you know, is somewhere in, in the mix. Uh, so the tree, the document node, obviously has children. So it, you know, if you have a page, there's children in there. You know, that's, those are, that's what you're interested in. Um, so there's a couple ways of accessing things. You can call various functions uh, called get element by tag name. So if you're looking for a p tag, you pass in p, yeah. it'll be the uh, string here, without the brackets. You're looking for the name. It's p. Uh, or if you're looking for, a, I don't know, it's another good one, a, you know, a tag, is that it? or a block quote. Maybe there isn't one. No script tag. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be funny. Um, so I guess you could scrub the no scripts. Uh, yeah, there's also by ID. And uh, you folks have probably seen that already. You've got a tag, the tag name, like p. Now, it can have a name, but that's not an ID. You're looking for the ID equals something. And that's what it's going to be looking for. IDs should be unique in the entire document. So if you've got an ID named, you know, maybe you've got a, uh, you know, an ID named X and another ID named X in the same document, I really couldn't tell you which one it's going to pick because some, some browsers do it differently. It might complain, and it might, I've never seen it complain, but it usually picks the first one. Be safe. Come up with unique names. Okay, so you can actually manipulate the DOM tree. You can create new things. That's how uh, various applications put in new feeds as they come in. It's an AJAX request. Every once in a while, it pulls the server, gets new stuff, and throws them in. Um, you can remove stuff. Uh, most of the time, people take the lazy way out and just change the style using JavaScript <laughs> instead of removing it. But if you remove it, it actually takes it out of the tree and uh, usually you can keep it, you can manipulate it, put it back later if you want. The, the possibilities are endless, and that's what you can do with the modifier. Now, the DOM tree contains objects. 
just like every other JavaScript thing. It's, 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 all, it's all the same. And these objects have methods, and they have members, just like a class. Now, the event system is handled by changing this, well, there's a list of events, but you call the functions on them for ease of manipulation, so you don't mess up. <clears throat> and uh, then you'll be able to uh, check for events. You can create new events. Uh, that's called dispatch. We'll get that a bit. And then there are various attributes of HTML tags. So if you have an A tag and its name is live, right? It's a bad name. But uh, if you first get the uh, element by name, so you look for the A tag and you get it, <coughs> you can look at the attribute. So you say get attribute name, and it'll give you back the, the, the string version of five or something. <laughs> and so you can. We'll look at attributes. That's part of the XML spec and things of that sort. But that's not too, too much here. Okay, so here's a here's a quick prototype syntax. This is how you include prototype in your code. I recommend putting it in the head, as I said before, because it'll wait to load all the JavaScript. It's a little long, but most browsers can parse it pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, now to use prototype, uh, is primary use, what I use it for, is looking up ID tags. Instead of saying get <coughs> tag by get element by ID and you know you gotta be in the document. Really quick syntax. Dollar sign function call and then the name of the ID. So this JavaScript here, let's figure out what it does. So we declare the, the page, we import prototype, we're in the body, we've declared a div. This div has the ID of time. Sorry about the flipped quotation marks. And it will say on the browser page, it'll display not yet set. That's because that's what I gave it. Now, when it gets to this line, what does it do? It says, oh, I want a new JavaScript. Sorry, I missed the language, but out of shortness here, I left it out. Mm. It'll say, get the ID, the element named time in the ID. So it'll give you this div tag. Go to the inner HTML. Because it's an object, it's inner HTML is some string. That's what's here. This is inner HTML. It's a it's a <coughs> attribute. It's a member member variable. And you say set it to a new string, new date. This new date will expand to today's date, current time. String will convert that date to a string representation of the date, and then it'll save it as. Uh, into this inner HTML and it will replace not yet set for the current date and time. Hmm. And that's what they'll see on the browser right after this executes. So that's pretty much <coughs> the first full blown example that I have. Let's see how to do it without a prototype. Hmm. You're going to see the same thing here, nothing's changed except we didn't include prototype. So the HTML document got shorter by maybe one hmm. Okay, so you've got the same statement here. This is how you do it without it. Document, you need the base variable. Document has everything in it. So if you call document get ID, you're probably going to find what you're looking for. Get by ID time. And that will return what you're looking for, and that's just business as usual as the last line. The other option is to actually traverse the tree. The document has a whole bunch of child nodes. <coughs> the first of these nodes is that div tag. So the body is in the document. So, so inside that one, oh sorry. Yeah. The document body is in the document. See, this is why it's confusing. That's why I don't like doing it. Then inside that you have to go to the first one, and that's body. This actually works, I tested it, but it's hard to do. And then do what you want to do. As you can see, this is just not the way to go. And you're confused. What's an object, what's not? Um, for instance, I was programming once uh, uh, an application for uh, myself, and uh, in Firefox, comments, an HTML comment, which is, you know, the, 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 the bracket, exclamation point, dash, dash, that's considered uh, an object, I think, inside the DOM tree. In IE, it's not. Uh -huh. So it will skip over the, uh, the comments in IE, but not in Firefox, and you've got the same code doing two different things in two different places. And, uh, that took a while to figure out what was going on there. Um, so doing that isn't really the way to go, which is why they have identifiers. 
Uh, sometimes you can't get away with it. Sometimes you want to generate a page dynamically. And you just got to be careful. OK, events. Uh, we're almost done here. Uh, again, user in is initiated, JavaScript initiated, browser initiated. And uh, for the most part, your users will launch them through links. Although you can put in stuff to watch what the user does. It's not really fast and it's kind of, kind of error prone. So uh, if you put these various events in um, link tags, A equals something, on click means when they click it, run the code. Again, on mouse over, when they put the mouse over, run the code. When they leave them, you know, on mouse out, when they leave, run the code. On load is for the document of the page. So when it loads the whole thing, then launch this script. That's good for waiting for something to finish loading, <coughs> like at the end. But again, you can do that by putting the hit tag in. And you know, there's a whole bunch more. OK, so here's our first DOM interaction, really. On click, I want to run the function foo. Not, not, really, not really important here. But your link will say click me, and when they click that, it will execute that function. I don't know what it did. You know, maybe it submitted a form. Uh, maybe it changed the link color. You can do style manipulation with uh, JavaScript and like that. Uh, well, there's a couple other ways of doing it. Uh, but as I said before, the tags, this a tag, is really just an obje uh, object in the DOM, and it has attributes. href is an attribute. You can change, once you say foo, could change the a tag to be something else, to execute on click something else. So when you click it, it will do something different each time if you haven't changed what it's doing. So you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, so there are a couple different ways of modifying the DOM. If you want to make a clone, so you want to duplicate stuff, you can clone the node. The variable is D. If it's true, it will clone everything under it. If it's false, it'll grab the copy of the first one, and then it'll leave pointers to everything. So, I don't know. Yeah, I usually use D. It's a little bit slower. Actually, it's a lot slower. You can push nodes on it, just like a, just like a vector. Append the node is a push. Um, when you make these changes, they're done in real time. So if you append lots of nodes, every time you append a node, the browser is going to refresh the page to redraw what you're doing. Well, it's not going to refresh the page. It's going to redraw. That gets slow and quick. Little bit of pointers from me to you. Do everything in the background. Build your tree, your subtree, off screen, and then uh, append it once so it redraws it all at once. If you don't do that, you'll be sorry. Trust me. <laughs> Dispatch event. Nice little function. You can have JavaScript create events. This is how it's done. Call this function, you pass in the event. I'm not going to get into how to create events at a later time. Um, this is an example. I kind of already covered this. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and skip to Ajax because I'm out of time here. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Sorry, this is pretty much a big topic. But uh, um, essentially, a uh, client makes a request to the server. Servers can't say, client, I'm ready for you to ask me for more information. The client has to be able to ask the server for more information, whether it's done you know, every once in a while. <coughs> Usually the, the user clicks a link or hits refresh or something. But it uses JavaScript over XML, and XML is a, a type, a data type, to send information um, to the server, like a request. You know, it'll be just like an HTTP GET or a POST request. And then it's going to get the information back in an XML form. And uh, what you could do is abuse this, and you can get back raw text instead of XML. I'm not going to go into that. But here's what it kind of looks like. I stole this again from a previous pre uh, presenter. Uh, modified it just slightly. Not really. Um, so here's what it looks like when you usually have a page without Ajax. You've got a client request something from the server or HTTP. The web server says, eh, let's figure out what they want. We usually use a type <coughs> of data. Maybe it returns the time. Then it'll look at the clock. It comes back to the web server. The web server says, put this in an HTML page. Send it back to the client. The client's going to get it, the web browser's going to display it, and they're going to say, yeah, it looks good, or no, I'll never come back to this website. Okay, they come back. Oh, right. um, now, the Ajax model is slightly different. There's one more component that they add. It's the Ajax engine. A little misleading. It's not really quite that complex. And essentially, your JavaScript will call Ajax, new Ajax request in the prototype. And uh, you'll say, go where? Go to the web server. So you provide a URL. And that URL will be based on the action that you want. You know, you can pass in the question mark and then your, your variables, or you can, you can make it a post, so it's like submitting a form. 
and the server will take a look at the variables that are passed in and hopefully do something with them different. Look at the data, pass it back to the web server, send it back up to the client. Uh, Ajax will look at it, pull it out of the XML for you. Uh, mostly, it's not like you can look at the you can look at the raw XML. You can look at um, the XML parse, like a DOM tree. So if it has, uh, you know, say you've got burgers and you've got a hamburger and a cheeseburger in an XML form, it'll come back <coughs> like a tree. It'll say burgers has hamburger, cheeseburger, and you can look at the child nodes just like you do on the on the on the DOM. Okay, um, this is how it looks in prototype. It's much much messier without prototype. Trust me. This is uh, something called XML HTTP request on the back end. You don't really need to know that for now. And essentially, you define these are, this is the minimum that you need. Uh, the URL is very important. That's where it's going to look for new information. It's going to make the request to the server. This is the method type, like a form. If it's get, it's going to go, all the variables are going to get appended to the URL in plain text. If you have something secure, like my password or my social security number, don't use get. Use post over HTTPS. But if you don't care what's being sent, use get. It's a little bit faster. Free. Um, on success is a handler. When this is done and it succeeds, this is what it should do. And what this will do is alert is a special function called the JavaScript brings up a pop-up window, and whatever text you pass into it, that's what it's going to display. You hit OK, it goes away. It's going to take the raw response text. So maybe the server says, hello, just plain text, hello. Not even XML. Your alert will say hello. Hmm. So it doesn't need to be XML-ish. You don't need to be afraid and all that stuff. Anyway, um, that's pretty much everything. Uh, here's what we've covered so far. The syntax, the types, objects, classes, the prototype library. Uh, class prototypes, the document object model, events, kind of, sort of, and a really crash course Ajax. Um, okay, good practices. Um, have an HTML fallback. Some people don't actually have JavaScript. Some people shut it off because they hate Flash. Um, cater to them if you can. It's a big pain in the butt, I know, but um, I, I will like you if you do. Um, comment your code. Uh, I think it should take uh, C comments and C++ comments, mm -hmm. you know, with the slash, star. Comments everywhere. If you don't, you will forget, and whoever comes after you will have no hair because they will curse your name into infinity and all that stuff. Um, <laughs> debuggers. Uh, not really hard to come by anymore. They used to be really, really hard to come by. Firebug it has by far the greatest um, word on the street as the best. It's a debugger, it's an interactive debugger, so you can change stuff, add variables, do all sorts of stuff. Um, eval can be your best friend or your worst enemy. If you pass something into eval and it, it's a strong string, and guess what? It's going to say eval error and whatever line. So if you have a string that executes, I don't know, 10 statements, it's going to say eval error, not your string. It will have no clue where your string is. It makes debugging much harder. Use it wisely. <laughs> um, Ajax is used for speed. So if you want to load a page real quick, and maybe they don't make use of a certain function on the page every time. If you have a, when they click on the link, load it from the server when they click on the link, or maybe after the page loads, you can speed up loading the web page, but still make it really rich. Because like I said, users are slow. They'll take a long time to actually click things and stuff. I'm way over time, but I'm almost done. Um, here's a heads up, JavaScript. Uh, in IE is not really 100% compatible. Microsoft, true to their nature, wrote their own version and called it JScript. My only advice, have several browsers on your computer. I've got Firefox, Opera, Safari, you know, you need them all. But usually Safari, Firefox, and Opera will work just fine. Mm -hmm. It'll be that IE element that really nails you. Um, <laughs> Use libraries to kind of mitigate this. Prototype works on a whole bunch of platforms. Depending on, well, you see, IE's DOM model, like the comments example, may differ from browser to browser. So if you want to refer to by IE, uh, Prototype has special handlers in there that will figure out which browser they're using and try and cater to that browser. So you can write better applications using Prototype. That's my biggest plug for Prototype. Um, yeah, I'm almost done. This is like the second to last slide. Uh, as I said, Firebug, Microsoft includes a script editor in IE. It sucks. It's awful. Um, but that's just one man's opinion. I've used it a couple times. But when IE screws up, but it doesn't screw up in Firefox, you kind of have no choice. Um, 
Again, uh, my best advice for you is get some type of text editor, not Notepad, not WordPad, something that supports coloring, so that you can, it kind of can figure out what's supposed to happen before it gets run. Usually, it might help you out a bit. Um, just links, and uh, that's, that's pretty much JavaScript in 55, 65 minutes. Mm.